Okay, this is uh, Mark Nurgis, and this presentation is New Jersey Turnpike Authority's Bridge Coating Assessment and Repainting Capital Program. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, but welcome, and uh, thank you in advance for your, your time and your attention. Uh, once again, Mark Nurgis with uh, Greenman Peterson. Um, I am here also on behalf of the New Jersey Turnpike Authority, uh, representing them to give you an overview uh, of that capital program uh, for bridge coatings, uh, the assessment and the develop development, excuse me, of the capital programs, uh, which has been ongoing. It started about 10 years ago, and uh, we've got a plan. We've gotten some jobs finished, uh, and we've got about the next uh, 10 years or so uh, planned out ahead of time. So to give you an idea, the New, uh, New Jersey Turnpike Authority, they are actually responsible for both uh, the New Jersey Turnpike Roadway uh, and also uh, the Garden State Parkway. Uh, the road on the uh, left that goes sort of diagonally across, that's the Jersey Turnpike. Uh, connects Delaware uh, and then services New York City. Uh, and then the road on the right uh, that runs along the shoreline there, that's the Garden State Parkway, again, services or serves the shoreline uh, and then runs from Cape May all the way up into uh, New York State there. So to give you a little history of the two roadways, uh, the New Jersey Turnpike opened in uh, 1951. Um, it was, uh, it is, it uh, has the honor of being the first toll road um, in New Jersey. Uh, it's just about 148 miles, or about 158 miles, 150 miles long, rather. Uh, but there's only 28 interchanges. So it is really the true definition of a limited access uh, highway. There's not many ways on and not many ways off. Um, it also has the privilege of owning uh, the largest inventory of weathering steel bridges um, in the country. Uh, when it was first built in 51, it was all painted steel. Uh, the bridge, or the, the roadway, was so popular so quickly that uh, within, before it was even 20 years old, they had to widen it and cr uh, construct a whole other alignment to go up toward uh, New York City there. So uh, during that original construction was painted steel during the widening in 1969. Uh, they primarily used weathering steel. They recently went through another widening, uh, kind of in the middle area there, central Jersey, uh, where they added 30 miles of uh, an outer roadway and all those structures as well uh, were weathering steel. So they, they bought in, you know, hook, line, and sinker. <clears throat> The parkway, on the other hand, uh, this bridge opened about, th or this roadway opened about three years later. Um, it's about 25 miles longer, uh, but in this case, you've got 365 entrances and exits. So it's a much more uh, accessible roadway. Uh, it's going from, uh, from north to south there. The bridge inventory for both roadways uh, comprise of the major structures, major bridges, and also routine. When we talk about a major structure, they're really their signature bridges. Uh, longer, higher, wider, um, typical, typically much more com complex structure types. We've got girder floor beam stringers, built up members. Uh, there's a tide arch, uh, deck trusses, through trusses, suspended spans, uh, that type of thing. Turnpike's got eight of these uh, that qualify. The parkway um, has 11 of them. Uh, the breakdown looks something like this. Uh, on the left hand side, we've got two of them on the turnpike that are painted steel three of them that are completely weathering steel uh, for these major bridges, and then three of them uh, that are a combination. Now these combinations are, as I mentioned, the widening that took place um, in 69 and 70. They widened those original bridges that were painted steel. They added girders uh, on the outsides, one on each side, and they're weathering steel. So there's a combination of the two. Uh, the parkway, we only have four. We've got four of them are painted steel. They only have one weathering, and one of those that's a combination. Uh, the other five bridges on the parkway are just pre-stressed concrete, so we're not as concerned uh, with the coatings on those. Routine bridge inventory, we've got uh, almost 600 on the turnpike and just over 500 um, on the parkway. Uh, the overwhelming majority, again, on the left-hand side is the breakdown of the turnpike ones. You'll see that more than half uh, are weathering steel. And we've got just over 300 on the turnpike. Conversely, about 60% of the parkways, uh, almost 320 of them are painted steel um, on the parkway there. So our relationship with the Turnpike Authority goes back well over 20 years. Um, they had a program in place more than 20 years ago, uh, more than 10 years ago rather, uh, that they were implementing and they were painting these bridges and then it kind of fell by the wayside. Uh, so they brought us on, uh, on board about 10 years ago. You know, we're kind of known, especially in the Southeast region, for our coatings expertise, primarily for the construction support and construction inspection, uh, but then also on the design side. That's where really we and I came into play. Uh, into play. Uh, you know, full service engineering firm, bridge engineering, highways, traffic, uh, but then our coatings expertise, what was called the light uh, for, for this particular assignment. So in order to develop the capital program, it was really a four-pronged approach. 
Uh, first and foremost was to identify the conditions and assess the conditions of those existing coatings. Do they need to be replaced? Um, how bad are they? And if they do need to replace, what is the process that we need to do uh, or utilize in order to uh, replace them? Then we take those and we prioritize the structures. We've got this list of 1,100 bridges. Uh, how many of them, again, are good, uh, bad, uh, fair, poor, maybe even severe um, in those cases? Prioritize that list and then schedule them um, accordingly. What needs to be tackled first, uh, when, how, um, and where. And then we take that and we develop the actual capital program. So we looked at the major bridges, we looked at the routine bridges, we prioritized those lists, identified the ones, first of all, identified the ones that needed it, then prioritize it. Then we went ahead and assigned uh, cost of estimates to each one. And we grouped them geographically, we grouped them as it made sense to address these structures, assign those costs, and then we could develop the capital program um, accordingly. Now once we have the capital program in place, now we proceed ahead um, with the design aspect. So first and foremost, we did focus uh, on those major structures. You know, they're the signature bridges, uh, the ones that you want to make sure, uh, you know, if something bad were to happen and they are, they need to be taken out of service. It's a much larger uh, impact on the traveling public. The patrons, these are, tra you know, toll roadways, so they have to really keep in mind uh, the patrons that are paying for the, uh, you know, the privilege or the right to use this roadway. Uh, so we wanted to focus on those first. And then we looked at the routine bridges. Now, a lot of those had fracture critical members. Uh, some of which had and had not been treated kind of in the previous capital program go around. So we wanted to identify those and address those that needed to be uh, somehow taken care of or uh, arrested if there were corrosion issues. And then finally pushed ahead with the routine bridge contracts, the rest of and really the majority of uh, their particular inventory. So first and foremost, with the major bridges, there's a limited number. And again, we started about uh, a little over 10 years ago. And by that point, the authority really did not have their bridge management system fully uh, populated. It was not as comprehensive as it is today. Uh, so we were able to just really go back to the bridge inspection reports and kind of old, the old school method of just flipping through the pages. Uh, we had a history with the turnpike, so we were aware and, and knowledgeable about these structures per se. Uh, already. So uh, between the two, we were able to roughly prioritize those bridges again, just based on the latest biennial inspection findings. Then we went out in the field and we visited each of these structures and uh, primarily to uh, identify the, the condition of uh, the existing coding systems. You know, how good bad was it? How bad was it? Um, how much corrosion is there? Um, we did some, uh, f some field testing of the coding. So we did the scratch test. We did the pull-off test. Uh, we did acquire samples for laboratory analysis to determine uh, what was the chemical composition or what was the makeup, uh, how many coats of paint were there, that sort of thing. Could this system be utilized for an overcoat or really was it way past its design life uh, or its service life and really needed to be uh, taken down? We also looked at uh, the extent and the severity of the corrosion. It was widespread. Is it localized? Is it very bad? Uh, is it not so bad? Is it surface rust or do you really have some section losses and holes uh, that need to be addressed and taken care of? We looked at the containment requirements, the environmental impacts, uh, the traffic impacts, uh, sort of just uh, generating all of these different scenarios uh, for these particular sites, what might uh, impact the costs if we were to go out there um, and repaint these uh, specifically. So our results, what did our results indicate? That uh, the existing coatings were present on all the structures. So none of these bridges in the past had had their original coatings removed. So that, that base, that foundation um, for the overcoating uh, in most cases, and even the overcoating was more than 20 years old, was the most recent. Uh, they were all original and uh, well, again, past their service life. So that something needed to be done with those. Uh, the generally speaking was up to about 30 mils in thickness and uh, six to eight coats of paint, again, generally speaking. Uh, some of them on the horizontal surfaces, we got on up into the, uh, into the uh, 50, 60 mils range, and in some cases, the low teens for the number of coats. Overall, the coatings were in bad shape. The picture that's represented here, that's uh, very much uh, representative of uh, their major structures uh, throughout there. So widespread peeling. They were very brittle. Uh, we were able to um, visually verify that there was mill scale present uh, throughout those as well. So with the mill scale, you know, that, that tenden has a tendency to fracture and, uh, and fail those coatings uh, as time goes on as well. Uh, the laboratory results came back. They all tested positive for heavy metals. So we knew we had lead. Uh, high, or high percentage of lead with the primer. We also had cadmium uh, and chromium. So we got hazardous metals with, uh, uh, or heavy metals rather, with the, uh, the conditions you see here. You know, a lot of these bridges cross through uh, urban areas, 
um, even suburban areas to a certain extent, and uh, you've got these releases, you know, so these environmental contaminations of this lead-based paint uh, really became an issue. Uh, laminar corrosion was present throughout. There were section losses. Uh, the weathering steel members we found that uh, generally uh, limited to the beam ends uh, and areas that were exposed to, say, like a splash zone uh, is where that laminar corrosion was present. Where there weren't the chlorides introduced, um, the, the, the patina was in good shape and was still protecting the steel. It was just where those deck joints had failed uh, or were they getting splashed with the chloride, uh, especially during the winter, uh, winter months, uh, areas that we needed to focus on. So then, we, had this, uh, we have all this data. We've got the bridge inspection information. We've got our field data. Now, how do we prioritize these structures? Well, we came up with a decision matrix, and we based it off of a four-component uh, scoring system. And we basically rated, we used the VIZ standards to uh, identify our uh, amount of corrosion uh, that Mark and uh, Aaron, uh, Aaron were talking about earlier. Uh, and then uh, what we did was for corrosion, for example, we took the degree times the extent. <clears throat> so how much, was it light, was it moderate, was severe, and then was it localized, um, or was it widespread? And we assigned points to all these and came up with a, an actual solid single number at the end, which would give us an idea of, what, okay, this is the worst case scenario, you know, and it sort of gets better um, as you go down the list. They all needed to be repainted, so it was like, how do we, you know, which ones do we do first and how do we do them? We then took that information, coordinated it with the capital program and the scheduling needs. So we didn't want to go out, if the, if the authority already had this bridge on tap to be uh, rehabilitated, uh, rehabil rehabilitated in uh, the next uh, five or six years, we didn't want to go out in two years and paint it. If they're going to come back and, and redo the whole thing, we would paint it then. So we coordinated those two schedules together, finalized that list, um, and then we proceeded ahead again with that design uh, aspect of it, basing all of our requirements uh, and our guidelines on the SSPC, you know, that standard tried and true. So for our routine bridges, now this has been a couple years later now that we started to focus on the routine bridges and with the fracture critical. So now the bridge management system uh, was much more robust and we were able to utilize that. So we queried uh, the authorities BMS to identify the bridges that had fracture critical members in the first place. And uh, what we found that the majority of them uh, were weathering steel, uh, they were uh, weathering steel box girders uh, for pier caps. Uh, and then there was one bridge uh, on the parkway that was not classified as a major bridge, but was a girder floor beam stringer uh, slightly more complex uh, structure configuration. And then the balance of the inventory, once again, we utilized uh, the BMS uh, to query it and uh, quickly identified all the bridges with uh, conditions that are uh, paint conditions in poor or fair condition. But that turned out to be about 25% of the turnpike's inventory, and almost 35% um, of the parkways uh, inventory. So quite a bit uh, that needed to be addressed um, at that time. Uh, through the BMS and the reporting, we were able to sort those lists um, by milepost and then delineate them further by region. So we had a north, a central, and a south region for the turnpike and the parkway. So up to six potential uh, repainting contracts. What we did then is coordinated the MPT and the access needs. So we've got these six contracts and there's a lot of twin bridges. So if you've got a local road over, uh, you might have a twin bridge where one right next to the other, but they're independent separate structures. In some cases, in, in quite a few cases actually, one of the structures was in worse shape con uh, coatings wise than the other one. But it didn't make sense to come out and just paint the one when the other one was on its way to failing. So we brought those together. Uh, so even though we'd be addressing one that's satisfactory or good, uh, at least we can leave that area and walk away and be done at least for hopefully 30, 40 years uh, before we needed to come back. We did the same field assessment, so we went back out, we did the coatings testing, we did the integrity testing, uh, the adhesion, the pull-off, uh, the took gauge to you know, determine how many coats of paint were there, sent the samples off to the lab to get tested, see what we're dealing with the heavy metals or the lead-based coatings, and then proceeded to design, again, uh, with the SSP requirements um, in the background. Okay, so now we have our structures identified, we know which ones we need to paint, what approach do we utilize to taking care of these? Uh, there's three different methods or three different approaches. The first being uh, the most popular, uh, the, less, the, the most expensive, but also the most popular uh, is that full, complete coatings removal um, and replacement. Uh, it's definitely best and it's really the only option for a failed coating system. You gotta get the old stuff off before you put the new stuff on. And I say not really applicable to weathering steel because there's not an independent coating system uh, for the weathering steel, just relying uh, on that patina itself. Uh, we then have spot repairs with a full overcoat. Now in this case, if the majority of the coating system is in good shape and has good adhesion, you can actually just come and focus your efforts on the areas that are failing or that you have some corrosion. 
uh, spot, clean, prime, and paint those, and then overcoat the whole structure, uh, the whole member, so that it looks nice and uniform. Very common maintenance painting method. Um, it can extend the life of the existing system, and that's what they had done more than 20 years ago was uh, this overcoating type method. Uh, however, it does rely on the integrity. Uh, so if the underlying uh, coating system, the original coating systems are brittle, or if they're pulling off, uh, as soon as you put that new system on, it's going to pull that stuff off uh, the substrate as part of the curing process. You could actually accelerate the failure uh, by going through this overcoating. And again, not really applicable uh, to weathering steel structures as there's no independent coating. And then zone painting. With zone painting, uh, we do, uh, that really does apply to both uh, weathering steel and painted steel structures. And here you're just looking at primarily the, a zone or an area that you need to paint. And most often, you know, with those deck joints, even with the painted steel bridges, it's typically the ends are that in the worst shape, right? So the weathering steel, same thing. If the deck joints are failing or you're getting uh, moisture and the chlorides in there, it's going to fail that steel uh, earlier. So we just need to address that particular uh, area. With the, uh, the turnpike authority likes to use about a one and a half times the beam depth for the extent of that zone. Uh, sometimes on the photo here, you can see we actually took it out to this stiffener to have a a nice clean cut line rather than just a cut line out on the beam um, itself. But generally speaking, it's about one and a half times the depth, and it, it is the preferred, really the only method for uh, the weathering steel. So what do we go with for our painted bridges? Well, with the complete coatings, removal, and replacement, uh, again, the existing number of co uh, coats of paint, the existing thicknesses, the fact that it was uh, failed throughout, the fact that there was mill scale present, the fact that there were heavy metals present. You know, we kind of, kind of put all these in place and said, you know, the best thing to do is just get it off and let's start from scratch uh, and get that new fresh system on there. Uh, for the weathering steel bridges, we went with that zone painting. Uh, again, primarily because the deterioration was limited to the beam ends um, and within the splash zones. Now, there were a few, few unique scenarios. A couple of the bridges had longitudinal joints uh, where uh, the chlorides were getting down in between. So the whole run of the girder or the whole run of the beam on that median side was in bad shape. In that case, we would specify cleaning and painting those um, as well. We had a couple special provisions um, involved for both the containment and how we handled, how we treated uh, the steelwork itself. Uh, the first was um, the Class 1A uh, containment, so SSPC Class 1A containment. Again, there were heavy metals present and um, verified, and uh, we wanted zero release uh, into the environment or into the atmosphere. So it was that Class 1A uh, containment required throughout. And then we also uh, specified rigid platform uh, for that containment. We actually got quite a bit of blowback from the contractors on this uh, initially. Um, the uh, more flexible method of chain link fence with a tarp on top of it, it's a lot cheaper uh, for them, but there's a lot of problems with it. Those tarps wear out quick. Uh, you got a lot of release uh, of the brace, abrasive blast media or the spent materials uh, down into the environment, and uh, we didn't want that again with the lead base. So we specified the rigid platform. Um, what we ended up doing actually was saying, well, if you're over a roadway or a waterway or other agencies' utilities, uh, though that, those areas you have to have rigid. If you're just over an infield, uh, there's l lower impacts there, uh, you can use your flexible containment. So we kind of went back and forth on that. And uh, out of all the contracts we've designed to date, they gave us all this blowback and they've all used rigid platform throughout. So I don't know why they're giving us such a hard time right out of the gate. But. Okay, for our painted steel work special provisions, uh, painted steel surface prep, SSPC, SP10, NACE number two, uh, the near white blasting, uh, a near white surface. Uh, was required throughout. Weathering steel surface prep. Now, weathering steel is a different animal because the surface profile is so drastically different than uh, sort of a regular steel member, uh, where you've got very high peaks and low lows. Now, this is microscopic uh, level, but very high peaks and low valleys. So, what we, uh, how we specified during design was you would abrasive blast it to an appearance of an SSPC SP10 NACE number two from a distance of about three feet. So from three feet away, if it looks like an SP10 surface, you're good to go. We didn't specify a very specific anchor profile um, for the weathering steel. And then there was removal of pack rust. So wherever there was pack rust on faying surfaces, uh, we had them come in and remove it to a depth equal to the thickness. So if you had an inch thick, you had to remove it at least an inch deep uh, as part of your surface prep and your cleaning. Okay, so now we nail down um, our, uh, our approach and our special provisions. Now we took a look at the coating systems, lots of different coating systems out there. Uh, top of the list, again, being that traditional three coat zinc um, epoxy urethane. It is NEP code approved, um, and it is really the standard for the greater northeast region, uh, regional area. 
Uh, we did look at the two-coat polyaspartic uh, build and see what kind of shape that was in and, uh, or how that might be applicable to it. And I've learned, I've learned something in the, the presentation from this morning <laughs> or just uh, the, the previous presentation. Uh, what we did see here that um, it is NEPCODE approved, so they do have NEPCODE approved systems uh, going into it. Um, as Mark and uh, Aaron mentioned, it uh, generally tends to be cheaper. There are fewer coats, faster drying times uh, throughout. Now, at the time, we began this program about 10 years ago, we said, well, there really wasn't that performance history uh, of this type of a system. So we didn't really want to risk it or consider it at the time. Things may change and we may look to explore. I know the Turnpike is very, they've gone through, they've done Noxide, they've done uh, Intumescent, they've done, they're, they're up for trying new things out. So this is something we can explore you know, down the line. All right, we looked at two coat epoxy mastics um, as well. These are popular, they've got, um, uh, they're lower VOCs, so they're, they're easier, they're much more environmentally friendly uh, for those ever increasing uh, requirements. Uh, they are comparatively low cost per gallon, however, uh, agency testing and FHWO is actually one of them as well uh, that tested these systems and found that they're really not, uh, they don't have very good performance against the chlorides. And uh, in the northeast area, that's, you know, heavy, heavy chlorides uh, to treat our roadways. And then we looked at calcium sulfates, waterborns, acrylics. Uh, these tend to be um, utilized in the, in the chloride-free states because they're, they're, they're a much softer system. Um, overall, and they're much more suspect or, or they're much more um, um, uh, exposed to absorbing those atmospheric or environmental um, contaminants. You know, a lot of the bridges, again, in the turnpike uh, on the parkway that go through industrialized areas, uh, maybe the atmosphere uh, not so friendly uh, for this type of environment. So we kind of put that one off the list. So what did we go with? Painted and weathering seal. We went with the traditional three coats, zinc, epoxy, urethane. Surprise, surprise. Uh, again, it's a NEPCODE system, so they, it's defendable. The turnpike can hi hang their hats on it, and it's a very uh, long uh, proven track record um, in the greater northeast region. We had some special provisions for uh, this system as well. Uh, the first was the penetrating sealer, uh, which we would uh, we specified application after the prime coat. And these were areas where we had pack rust, uh, crevice corrosion, um, any kind of separations between plates or between fanging surfaces, they had to, and it had to be brush or roller applied. We didn't want them spraying applied. We wanted to make sure everything, every area um, got covered. We also had a stripe coat. The stripe coat also went in after the primer. Um, it also went, or it went in also after the penetrating sealer if that was applied. Now the stripe coat was basically all fanging surfaces, so rivet heads, uh, all angles, say if you had a web plate and a, and a flange angle, um, anywhere that there was a gap, uh, or a, an overlap rather, um, we had the, the, um, uh, the stripe coat applied. And again, brush or roller applied to make sure uh, we got that coverage. Caulking was uh, specified before the finish coat. So you go and you put your primer, your uh, intermediate coat, you come back and you caulk any areas where there is that separation. Again, mostly pack rust. Um, or crevice corrosion where there's an open gap, get the caulk in there, seal out the moisture as best you can, come back and top coat it so that all that caulking um, disappears. You don't have caulk lines um, all over the bridge. And then on the weathering steel, we specified two full coats of the intermediate. And again, this goes back to the fact that the surface profile is drastically different. You've got the high highs and the low lows. Um, you want to make sure you have that coverage. You don't want too thick of a zinc coating. Uh, that can be very uh, detrimental to the coating system itself. Um, so you put the zinc on, and that first coat of intermediate, we wanted to make sure that we had enough of a film above those high peaks uh, to protect them. So we figured with two full coats of the, of the intermediate, uh, you get that without a, a solid high build uh, right out of the gate, and you make sure you got everything sealed off, and then come back with the top coat. So where do we stand? So at the end of about 10 years now, the first part or first half of this, uh, this program has been finished. And uh, we've gotten five of the major bridges taken care of in four uh, repainting specific contracts. So four contracts just to repaint the bridges went out. We got, got the five of them taken care of. Uh, four more were completed under rehab or uh, full out replacement projects uh, where painting was uh, folded into the mix there. Uh, three more of them are planned for repainting under upcoming uh, rehabilitation or widening contracts. And they're, all three of those are actually currently um, in design, so they'll be taken care of. Uh, one of the steel bridges on the parkway was uh, less than 10 years old. Um, at, at the time of the initial study, it was, uh, had just opened the traffic, so that was in good shape. We still don't have to worry about that one. And then the last remaining bridge 
there's a weathering steel structure um, on the turnpike uh, that remains outstanding. And uh, that one is planned to be addressed within about the next four or five years. That one was actually not in that bad a shape, and it was pretty much lowest on our list to begin with, so it all worked out uh, pretty well. The uh, total painting-related construction value was greater than $250 million, um, and that is just for the painting aspect. It doesn't account for structural steel repairs or small repairs or anything like that on the sub. That was just containment, uh, the environmental impacts, uh, and the actual coating system um, itself. For the routine bridges, where we stand there, uh, all the fracture critical members were taken care of under one single contract. Uh, that equated to 17 structures, a lot more than 17 box girders or transverse girders, uh, but there were 17 bridges total with those uh, qualifiers. They're all done. We actually also sealed the deck joints under those contracts. The coating system's not gonna last if you don't seal it up and keep the chlorides off of it, so we put all new deck joint, uh, deck joint seals in, a couple reconstructions uh, where they needed to be reconstructed, and they came back and cleaned and painted. Uh, and then we did take care of that one girder floor beam stringer bridge uh, that got taken care of. 18 of the highest priority parkway bridges were taken care of, again, under one single contract. Um, and then we've got six more uh, that are identified. Uh, two of them are actually about to go out for design. And uh, over the next, um, I'm going to say probably eight to maybe 10 years or so, they'll be releasing two per year uh, to year and a half to maybe two years, depending on what that overlap looks like um, over the next course to take care of those six, the Turnpike and Parkway, North, Central, um, and South. And we're estimating the total painting-related construction value there is to be a little bit more than about $100 million uh, to get all those taken care of. So. Did you say that uh, for the weathering steel bridges, you only painted the uh, zone painted the ends? That's correct. Yeah, only zone painted. Yep. Have you found, though, that uh, during the time frame now that they've been out there, that the spray from the salts with the traffic traveling underneath it is causing greater accelerated uh, corrosion in those areas? In other words, the patina is not holding up, and now those uh, heavy scale is actually building up on your bottom flanges and over the traffic lanes. Over the and that's exactly what we've been finding, yeah. And it, and it actually has a lot to do with the, the vertical clearance. Uh, the ones that are closer to the roadway, I mean, it uh, makes sense, you know. The ones that are closer to the roadway, you get more upspray. So yeah, it's the undersides of those flanges. It, it hasn't really been uh, too much of an issue on the, the base of the web, but it's really the flanges that are getting those laminars. So those areas we actually consider just painting the whole underside. Uh, of those as well, yep. And the, the weathering steel structures, um, the new ones that they put out, uh, that they, they built during the widening most recently, they went ahead right from the shop and painted the ends. Uh, they're not even gonna bother. They're just gonna come out with painted steel beam ends right out of the gate, yeah. Evidently had great success according to a very in-depth, thorough article in a very respected magazine on coatings uh, not that long ago mm -hmm. uh, with fluoropolymer. Okay. And I'm curious, did you mention that at all in your presentation? Did not. No, that, that was an option we haven't considered yet. But, um, you know, the program, we established it 10 years ago, and we've got it planned out for the next 10 years, but we look at it every couple years. Um, the polyaspartic would be one that they've come a long way now in the technology, and there is that track record that we can now maybe look to see. So that would be an area that we'd look to explore uh, down the line. Yep, absolutely question on the penetrating sealer. Okay. What type of uh, penetrating sealer did you use and why was it applied after the prime coat? Wouldn't you put it before so it could penetrate? Uh, the, the prime coat, um, it, it's part of the, um, uh, part of the, the manufacturers, they have, pen, they've had specific penetrating sealers that are compatible to their specific systems. Uh, so we've got four manufacturers um, identified uh, right there. And um, with, the, um, with the application of the primer, uh, we want to just make sure that we had that coverage um, before uh, the penetrating sealer went on. Um, you know, from a timing perspective, I'm not really sure uh, why we did the one versus the other. Uh, I'd have to go back and look at that. But why we specified the sealer after the prime coat, I'm, I'm actually not exactly sure. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure. I can, I can get back to you on that. You're really going in through the, the total removal right now. Have you decided on what you're going to use if you ever find one that you want to overcoat? What system are you going to use? Oh, what system? It would be, um, uh, we would go with more of a traditional type system. We would spot, the, so the spot areas, we would still do the, the spot cleaning. Uh, we would do the primer and the epoxy intermediate. And then depending on the condition of the rest of the finish, we'd come back and just finish coat everything. But we'd still use the three coat over the areas that needed to be spot cleaned and painted. Yeah.
Uh, the preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.